Hi guys, my name's Aisha. I'm a dual qualified foundation doctor and the survival guide program lead. This talk is about blood gases. It's a subject that you might find a bit tricky, but it's more important to understand why and when they are done for unwell patients, especially if you're working in a maxillofacial unit. So here's our aims and objectives for this session. So hopefully by the end of this talk, you'll understand the basics of acid-base balance physiology a little bit better. You'll understand the differences between respiratory and metabolic causes of an acid-base disturbance. You're hopefully going to understand the indication for an arterial blood gas versus a venous blood gas. You'll be able to understand the basic interpretation of a blood gas and to also understand some most common causes of um, the acid-base disturbances in our unwell patients. I will say though, the main take home point from this talk is that if your patient is unwell enough to need a blood gas, you really need to be calling for help. We're not hoping to turn you into sort of expert blood gas interpreters, but more to understand the basics of them. So you've got a bit of an idea of what could be going on and also so you can have a bit more of a discussion with your senior. So what's on an arterial blood gas? As you can see, lots and lots of values. So these blood results differ from the usual kind of blood samples that we send because you take the blood test to an analyzer yourself. So you can get the result back within minutes, which makes a big difference. So for patients that are unwell, you know, we want to kind of see some more immediate values such as like, what's their oxygenation doing? Do they have a high lactate? Has their hemoglobin dropped if they're bleeding? So that's why we might want a quicker sample than, you know, sort of having to wait a couple of hours for an FBC. So you'll take the blood sample to the analyzer and it spits out something that looks a little bit like a shopping receipt with all the numbers on it in front of you. So for the sake of simplicity for this session, we're just mostly going to focus on the pH, the partial pressure of oxygen, carbon dioxide and bicarbonate. But as I said, you can see the lactate, glucose and the hemoglobin on there as well. So what's the difference between a venous and an arterial blood gas? So as it sounds like, the arterial blood gas is taken from an artery, so that means that the oxygen saturation on that is going to be more accurate than on the venous one. So the main indication for an arterial blood gas over a venous blood gas, because they are they are quite painful, so we don't we want to try and avoid doing them if we can, is that any patients who's desaturating or they're breathing very fast, so they're tachypneic, in order to try and maintain that oxygen saturation, we want to know what their blood oxygenation is doing. So a VBG is taken for any other sick patient who doesn't have low SATs or isn't breathing quickly, okay? Um, importantly, uh, you might be able to see on there as well, the amount of oxygen that the patient is on has been entered because that's really important to consider and we're going to go over that in a little minute. So when it comes to the acid-base balance, there's two main mechanisms that help keep this in check. So one is the respiratory component and one's the metabolic component. Just to note as well, guys, this is an extremely simplified version because um, it's, you know, obviously it's aimed at those of you who are DCTs currently. So for those of you who are currently at or about to go to medical school, you're going to learn this in far more detail, including some of the other electrolytes that are going to disturb this mechanism as well. So the normal pH of the blood is between 7.35 and 7.45. So the body will try and do whatever it can to try and maintain the blood pH within that range because if it goes too far below and you become acidotic, the cells don't function as well and same with the alkalosis as well. So if your pH goes under 7.35, you're acidotic. If it goes above 7.45, you're alkalotic. So having a think about the respiratory mechanism, the main aspect of this is that we produce carbon dioxide, right? So it's excreted by cells as a waste product. It's also in the air that we breathe. So when the carbon dioxide is in the blood, it reacts with water and it becomes carbonic acid. So that makes the blood more acidic if there's too much carbon dioxide. So having a bit more of a think about that um, aspect there. So if you're unable to breathe out your carbon dioxide because you've got an obstructive lung disease such as COPD or fibrosis or you've got some sort of restriction to the muscles that control your thorax, um, you know, saying like certain types of um, neurological diseases, you're going to have more carbonic acid in the blood because you can't breathe out that carbon dioxide. So that's going to cause an acidosis. OK, so the body's first reaction to this is to increase your respiratory rate so you can try and get rid of that carbon dioxide faster. So that's why in some patients that have an acidosis from something else that actually doesn't have anything to do with, you know, being obstructed. So like a diabetic ketoacidosis. One of the first signs is that their breathing rate gets faster because you're trying to blow off that carbon dioxide to try and um, get rid of the carbonic acid in the blood.
And so looking at kind of values that you may see on a patient's ABG that has a respiratory acidosis, you can see the um, example in the corner there, the pH might have dropped, so it'll fall below 7.35 because the patient's acidotic, and their PCO2 will rise. So some causes of respiratory acidosis, as I said earlier, anything that obstructs the outflow of um, you breathing out, so things like asthma, if the patient's having an asthma attack and they're tiring, uh, things like COPD or even a pneumonia um, may affect the patient's ability to, to breathe out well. And anything that also um, affects your respiratory drive, so any sort of central nervous diseases or, or toxins as well. And then looking at the opposite end of the spectrum with that, a respiratory alkalosis, so if you are breathing too fast and you're getting rid of your carbon dioxide too quickly, you're going to have less carbonic acid in the blood and the blood's going to become more alkaline. So again, if you have a look at the example in the corner there, we can see there that the pH has risen and the carbon dioxide has moved in the opposite direction because it's gone down. Um, and that's because we don't have as much carbon dioxide in the blood to dissociate into carbonic acid and therefore you become alkalotic. So some causes of a respiratory alkalosis are, um, the most common one is actually a hyperventilation. So patients that have having an anxiety attack, they'll be breathing very quickly as they hyperventilate. They'll be blowing off all that carbon dioxide and then they can become alkalotic. Uh, and another cause is also having a PE, um, as that means that you're also gonna become, um, you're gonna be breathing too fast and you can uh, end up blowing off your carbon dioxide as well. So as I said earlier, the respiratory component, this takes minutes to adjust. So if you're acidotic or alkalotic, your body's chemoreceptors will detect that very quickly and the breathing rate will begin to adjust very quickly. So if you are acidotic, your body will try and speed up your breathing rate to try and get rid of the carbon dioxide, get rid of the carbonic acid. If you are alkalotic, the body will try and slow down your breathing rate. So you try and retain a bit more CO2, which um, dissociates into carbonic acid and brings the pH back into the normal range. So there's a couple of different types of respiratory failure. I'm sure you hopefully will have heard of these whilst you're at dental or medical school. So um, type one respiratory failure is just where the patient has desaturated and their oxygen only is low. A type two respiratory failure is where you have a low oxygenation, but also the carbon dioxide has increased because you are retaining carbon dioxide. So the main thing to remember about respiratory mechanisms is that the carbon dioxide will move in the opposite direction to the pH. So when we're talking about patients becoming acidotic and their carbon dioxide is high, so once the pH is low, the carbon dioxide is high. In alkalosis, it's reversed. So that means that the patient's pH will be high, but their, PCO, uh, their PO, PCO2 will be low. Sorry. So the other side of this mechanism is the renal aspect uh, or the metabolic aspect. So the kidneys produce and they also reabsorb bicarbonate, which is a, a good buffer for acids. So the more bicarb is produced or if it's not used up, it, it's more alkaline and so you become alkalotic. Or if the bicarb gets used up because you are acidotic and um, it's being used as a buffer or it's not being produced due to some sort of like renal pathology and some sort of kidney failure, you can get an acidosis. So the main th difference between this mechanism and the other one is that it's important to remember that this mechanism, the metabolic component, takes about 48 hours or so. Um, so patients say like with an acute respiratory problem, like an acidosis due to a bad asthma attack, won't get the bicarb compensating. And that's how we can tell whether or not that type two respiratory failure, where you are retaining carbon dioxide, is chronic or acute. And so thinking about the metabolic al alkalosis, we'll just have a little look at the example that's in the corner there. So as you can see, the bicarb has increased and because it's alkaline, it's also caused the blood to become alkaline. So what can cause this and why? So vomiting is one of the uh, more common reasons that we may see patients with a metabolic alkalosis on a blood gas because what happens is um, you lose your stomach acid and because you've lost those acidic um, cations from your stomach, the blood will move the um, acidic portion um, back into the stomach to maintain that and then as a result your blood becomes a bit more alkaline. Patients may be taking things that can cause um, them to become more alkalotic such as medications, so antacids and diuretics are the other common causes.
and now thinking about a metabolic acidosis. So if the bicarbonate gets used up as a buffer, so say if you've got something like a respiratory acidosis going on, um, or it's not produced due to some sort of like kidney pathology, uh, you'll get an acidosis because we don't have enough bicarbonate in the blood to buffer things as well. Um, so as I said, it takes 48 hours or more. So anyone who's got an acute respiratory problem, like so say if they're having an asthma attack or they're having an, an exacerbation of their COPD, but if they don't normally retain carbon dioxide, but they suddenly are retaining because of um, the outflow obstruction, when you take an ABG on that patient, you won't see the bicarb having changed. It should be normal. So um, COPD patients who do chronically retain carbon dioxide will always have a bit of a lower bicarbonate because it's being continuously used up to buffer that excess carbonic acid. And that's how we can tell whether or not the patient is a chronic retainer and whether or not they need their saturations adjusting. So some common causes of metabolic acidosis, so sepsis is one of those. As you get more anaerobic uh, respiration, you get more lactate produced, which is an acid, uh, and then you get a lactic acidosis. You can get um, patients who have poorly controlled, usually a type 1 diabetes. Uh, they can get diabetic ketoacidosis, where you get acidic ketone bodies produced because the body can't use glucose for energy. Patients with kidney failure won't produce bicarb. So again, they can um, have a chronic type of a metabolic acidosis. And we can also get a drug-induced metabolic acidosis as well. Now, coming to how we can look at a set of blood gas results and try and interpret them. So this is a really easy mnemonic that I learned as a medical student. And it's ROME, which stands for Respiratory Opposite Metabolic Equal. Now, if you remember, I said earlier that if it's a respiratory cause of an acidosis or an alkalosis, the CO2 will move in the opposite direction to the pH. And that's what the respiratory opposite is pertaining to there. So you're looking at the pH in relation to the CO2. If they move in the opposite direction, it's a respiratory cause of the acidosis or the alkalosis. If it is a primarily a metabolic cause um, of either, the pH and the bicarbonate will move in the equal direction. So as the bicarbonate increases, the pH will also increase for you to become more alkalotic. As the bicarb decreases, the pH will also decrease as you become more acidotic. This is a very, very oversimplified way of just being able to have a look at it because as we're about to find out, patients can have a mixed acidosis. Um, as we said earlier, people can compensate for uh, respiratory acidosis with bicarb. So all of those things can sometimes make things a bit more complicated. But just as an oversimplified way of remembering kind of how you can try to tell whether or not it's respiratory or a metabolic problem, here's a really easy uh, mnemonic to, to learn. And so now in the typical survival guide fashion, we're gonna move on to some cases. So if you now imagine that you have the DCT on call for the day, so you get a phone call from one of the nurses on the ward who tells you that there's a 79 year old male who's post-op of having a wide local excision of the tongue with a local reconstruction and he's also had a bilateral neck dissection. She wants you to come and see him because she's saying that he's now confused. Um, and when you have a look, you can see the patient's got a past medical history of angina, type 1 diabetes and hypertension. So we always try and encourage you guys to remember to get as much information as you can from the person that's calling you. So have a, another think about what other information would be very useful here. Um, and I would say it's likely going to be the patient's observations because those are things that the nurses can do quite easily and quite quickly. And will give you a good picture as well of uh, whether or not you need to go and see this patient very quickly. So they've done the patient's observations. Just gonna give you a few seconds to have a look at those and have a think about what you may be concerned about. So having a think, this patient is tachycardic and he's also breathing a little bit faster than he should be. He is maintaining his saturations but that breathing rate alone is kind of making you think ah, he's having to breathe faster than usual to maintain the saturations. So how are we going to assess the patient? we're going to do an A to E assessment. So for the airway and breathing part, so we have a look at the patient, his airway is patent, he's able to respond to you in full sentences, but he is short of breath when he's speaking to you. You can't see any obvious airway compromise or any signs of any airway compromise like drooling, but um, there does, he does have a bit of post-op swelling intraorally as we would expect. 
Looking at the breathing aspect, so the patient's sat to 97% on room air, the respiratory rate is a little bit high, um, and then we'll say that you can have a listen to the patient's chest with a stethoscope, uh, and we'll say it's clear and he's got good expansion as well. So remember, we don't just do an A to E assessment just to look at things, we also perform interventions and investigations when we need them as well. So because this patient is breathing fast, we should really be looking to take an arterial blood gas, an ABG, and we should also get a chest x-ray as well because we're concerned that there might be a breathing problem. So moving on to the rest of the A to E assessment, the patient's blood pressure is 105 over 75, which is on the lower side of normal. However, if you have a look at the patient's OBS, you'll be able to see whether or not that's been normal for them post-op. The patient's heart rate is 115, so it's a bit on the higher side. Um, it's always worth asking the nurses to, to do an ECG for patients that are tachycardic as they may have uh, developed an arrhythmia or something. Um, the patient's capillary refill is two seconds, and he also tells you that he's passing urine more frequently. Thinking about the disability side, so the patient is drowsy, um, he's responding to your voice, but you can't really sort of class him as being alert. Um, his pupils are equal and reactive, and the nurses have kindly done his blood glucose, and they tell you it's 31. Um, and then the exposure side, so that's when we do a top-to-toe systematic examination of the patient, just to make sure we've nothing else we've missed, no swellings, no rashes. So his calves are soft, they're not swollen, they're not red. Um, you know, the abdomens um, soften things and you can't see any other rashes either. So we've taken an arterial blood gas for this patient because of that respiratory rate. And this is what we've got. So the pH is low at 7.19. Patient's oxygenation is normal uh, at 14. You can see the normal ranges on that side. Um, the PCO2 is low and the bicarbonate is also low. The lactate is normal and we already knew the blood glucose was really, really high. So having a think using our Rome acronym of to try and figure out is it a respiratory problem or is it a metabolic problem? And you're always looking at the pH in relation to the PCO2 for the respiratory or in relation to the bicarb for the metabolic. So we'll start with the respiratory side first. So the pH is low. You would expect the PCO2 to move in the opposite direction so as the pH drops, the PCO2 usually rises. Here, we can see it's moved in the other direction. So we don't think that it's a respiratory cause. But what we can see is the bicarbonate has also dropped. So it's most likely going to be a metabolic acidosis. And the reason that his PCO2 is low is because he's been breathing fast and trying to blow off that PCO2. So what's happened here? This patient has a metabolic acidosis because he's unfortunately gone into diabetic keto ketoacidosis. Um, this does sometimes happen with our patients when they have poor diabetic control postoperatively. So the treatment for this is you would call the medical team and they're going to start him on a whole bunch of IV fluids and some fixed rate insulin as well. But it is important to know that patients who are diabetic can become unwell very quickly. So even, you know, sort of slight modi modifications in their observations, you know, any sort of drowsiness or any sort of change in their kind of how they've been, I would definitely be speaking to a senior um, and getting some investigations done quite quickly. And now on to the next case. So again, you're on call, and this time you're called by the A&E department. So they have a 24-year-old female who's presented with bilateral submandibular swelling, about trismus of about a centimetre and some pain associated with the lower left-hand side. So again, have a think about what, what other information we want to know. We definitely, it would be useful to know what our past medical history is at this point, but of course, we always want to know the patient's observations. So here's the observations. Have a look at those and have a think about what is concerning you. So already we can see that patient saturations are borderline, they're 94%. And to go alongside that, this patient's respiratory rate is 27, which is very high. So she's also breathing very fast to try and maintain her oxygen saturations is, isn't quite getting there. She has a heart rate of 130, which is very high, but most concerningly, her blood pressure has dropped and it's 89 over 60. She's also got a raised temperature as well. So putting those observations together, we have a raised temperature, we've got a raised heart rate and also a dropped blood pressure. We need to be thinking about sepsis. So especially given that she's got a dental abscess, that would be the most obvious um, 
pathology going on here. But the whole reason that we do the A to E assessment is to rule out anything else that's life-threatening. And we just need to make sure that there's nothing else that could be causing this as well. So looking at the patient's airway, her airway is patent. She doesn't have any immediate airway risks, even though she has that swelling. So she's not drooling. She doesn't have a hot potato voice and you can't hear any other additional noises like strider. Um, but she does look visibly short of breath again. And when you look at her breathing, um, so as we said, she's breathing fast. Her respiratory rate is 27. She's just about maintaining normal sats of 94% on room air. And her chest is clear. Um, one of the A&E doctors tell you that they had a listen. As we said earlier, an A to E assessment is not just for the assessment. We need to order some investigations and do some interventions for this patient. So the first thing that I would be doing is giving this patient some oxygen. Um, the whole picture um, of her observations and the possible sepsis is quite concerning. So I would give this patient 15 litres of oxygen via a non-rebreathe mask at 15 litres per minute. Um, as we said earlier... Uh, the main indications for getting an arterial blood gas over a venous blood gas is any patients that's desaturating and or breathing quickly. This lady has a combination of both, so she definitely needs an ABG. And because she's also breathing quickly and things, we would look to get a chest x-ray as well just to rule out any other sorts of um, lung pathologies. Going through the circulation aspect, so her blood pressure is low, it's 89 over 60. Her heart rate is 130 and her capillary refill time is also delayed at 4 seconds. She hasn't passed urine today, but she also tells you that she hasn't eaten or drank. So just thinking about the investigations and the interventions there. So we need to make sure that this patient has some IV access because we're going to give her some fluids. We would give her a fluid bolus of 500 mils, presuming she doesn't have any known heart failure or renal failure, um, of something like Hartman's or plain saline over less than 10 minutes. And we're going to see if her blood pressure incre improves with that. If it doesn't, we'll be giving her another bolus and we would be calling for help because this drop in blood pressure is quite concerning that the patient's going into septic shock. Her heart rate is 130 likely due to that hypovolemia. However, we should always be looking to get an ECG as well, just in case that there's something that we've missed. Um, she hasn't passed urine today. Depending on how things are, we can consider putting a catheter in to measure her urine output, um, but that's something to discuss with one of your seniors because catheters, um, they, they are good for measuring urine output, but they're another source of infection. And, uh, oh yeah, once we've got that IV access as well, we'd be looking to get some bloods off the back of that cannula. So we'd send off things like an FBC, use an ease, CRP, LFTs, um, and a group and save as well, possibly if we think she might need to go to theatre. Uh, assessing her disability score. So um, she is also a bit drowsy when you do the NAV poo assessment. So she, that means that she would probably be alert to, uh, sorry, responding to your voice. Her blood glucose is normal at six and her pupils are equal and reactive um, to light. And so when you again do your tops toe examination, just to make sure there's nothing else that you've missed, her calves are soft, they're not swollen, no signs of DVT or anything like that. Her abdominal exam is normal, but she is quite pale. She's generally quite sweaty and a bit irritable as well. So as we said, we we're going to take an arterial blood gas for this patient. So again, having a look using the Rome systematic approach, we're going to look at the pH and we're going to check the CO2 and we're going to check the bicarb to see if we think it's a respiratory or a metabolic, metabolic problem. So the pH is low, this patient is acidotic. Having a look at the pCO2, that's normal. If it was on the higher range, we could maybe think that there was a respiratory acidosis. But looking at the bicarbonate, that is low. So that's the metabolic equal. The pH and the bicarb have moved in this equal direction. Um, and that's because this patient's lactate is high because she's septic. So she's um, having a lot of anaerobic respiration, which is giving off that lactic acid. And therefore the bicarbonate is trying to buffer that lactic acid to bring the pH back to normal. And that's why it's low there. So thinking about the high lactate, as we said earlier, we've mentioned the word, we need to think about the sepsis six. So the sepsis six, uh, really, really important protocol to remember, no matter sort of whereabouts in hospital you're working. So the, um, the thing is that you give three and you take three. So the sepsis six is so you would give oxygen to keep the sats above 94%. We would also give IV antibiotics. You can have a look at your local guidelines, such as through the micro guide app to see what's recommended. But generally, we tend to give something broad spectrum. And we also give IV fluids as well. 
Things that we take out from the patient is so we would take bloods and blood cultures. Uh, alongside that, we take their lactate and we'd also measure their urine output and we can take a urine dipstick as well to look for a urine infection. So that's the end of the cases. I've just got a couple more examples where we can kind of work through the blood gas results just to give you guys a bit more understanding of what we look at as to how we interpret them. So we've just got a couple more of these just to have a look at here. So what does this ABG show and why? So again, I've got the little Rome acronym in the corner there that we can use. So we're always looking at the pH in respect to either the CO2 or the bicarb to describe whether or not it's a respiratory or a metabolic problem. But also concerningly on this blood gas, we can see that the patient's oxygen has dropped to eight, so they're hypoxic as well. So looking at the pH, it's dropped. So this patient is acidotic and their PCO2 has gone in the opposite direction, it's increased, so we can confidently say this is going to be a respiratory acidosis with hypoxia. So this is a type one respiratory failure. Remember at the beginning of the talk, we talked a bit about type one and type two respiratory failures. Type one respiratory failure is where you don't have the um, CO2 retention. And because this patient's bicarb is completely normal, so there's been no metabolic compensation, we know that this is acute. So say if this is a patient that you that has COPD as a known diagnosis, we could say, okay, they don't normally retain CO2. We are aiming for their oxygen saturations to be over 94% as usual. So other things that can cause this, so it's kind of anything that causes a reduction in your oxygen. So a patient could have pneumonia, have a pneumothorax, they could have heart failure, they could be having an asthma attack. Um, but that's kind of the, um, the way to have a look at this. Remember to always just look at the pH and then look at it in regards to the PCO2 or the bicarb. And so we've got another ABG here and this one's a little bit simpler. So if we have a look, we can see the pH has risen. So this patient is alkalotic. PO2 is normal, which is good. PCO2 is also normal, but the bicarb has also risen. So it's the pH and the bicarb have risen in an equal direction. So it's a metabolic alkalosis. So what could have caused this? As we said earlier, things like vomiting um, or things like diuretics as well. And so for our final example, we've got another ABG. So you can see a lot of red there. So all the values are abnormal, however, don't let that phase you, work through it in a systematic manner. So the first thing that we can see is the patient is hypoxic, which is not a good thing. So, um, but in terms of interpreting the, the main aspect of the blood gas, we're gonna look at the pH first, which is low. So the patient is acidotic. And then we're gonna move on to look at the PCO2. Now that's moved in the opposite direction to the pH, which fits with our respiratory acidosis. However, if we also look at the bicarb, that's also low, which would also fit with a metabolic acidosis. So what we need to try and decide is whether or not this patient has a mixed respiratory and metabolic acidosis, or whether or not that's the body attempting to compensate because the patient has a chronic type 2 respiratory failure. So that is a little bit beyond the scope of this talk. So for the sake of this, we're going to say this patient has a respiratory acidosis, a type 2 respiratory failure, which is chronic due to that because that's why the bicarb is low. Um, so things that can cause a type 2 respiratory failure, so hypoventilating, uh, you know, if patient is given too much opioid, um, they won't be bre their respiratory rate will drop and that CO2 will accumulate. Um, we can have something like an outflow obstruction, as we said earlier, things like asthma, COPD, um, or you can have an impaired respiratory drive, um, so a low GCS could cause that as well. So we've come to the end of the talk, guys. Thanks very much for watching and staying with us. I know that that was a pretty tricky subject. Um, if you'd like to do any further reading, so the Geeky Medics website has a really handy guide on um, arterial and venous blood gases, how to interpret them, but also some videos on how to actually take one. We haven't covered that in this talk because it's a practical skill, so it's a little bit difficult to do via a lecture. However, there's about 100 videos on YouTube that you can watch if you want to see how to take one. Um, the best way to practice is, you know, if there's any opportunities to do any on the wards um, with your seniors, then definitely ask them if they're willing to supervise you or show you how to do one.
Mind the Bleep also has some very handy guides on how to interpret blood gases. Um, E-Face is a set of modules that was developed by a Max Fats trainee. Um, I think blood gases are also in there, but there's also a lot of very useful physiological talks um, that will help you revise some of the basic science as well. And all, as always, the on-call in um, OMFS book is, is also really handy. And if you have any questions or any suggestions for any further talks that you'd like to see on our website, please do drop us an email at omfssurvivalguide at gmail.com um, and you can watch the rest of the talks on our website um, and also keep an eye out for our Instagram and Facebook pages for flashcards and other educational material that we'll be posting. Thanks very much.